Hey everybody, and welcome to another evening of Vertical Parenting. We are in session six tonight, and we've been excited each week because Heather and I have had the privilege of having some of our kids be a part of each of the sessions, and we'll do that again even next week. But tonight, I'm excited because Heather's dad is joining us, and uh, not only is he her dad, uh, he's the grandfather of our children, uh, but he's also my pastor from my years as an early years as a Christian and my mentor for ministry. So I'm glad to have him with us tonight. And you'll hear me refer to him as Brother Nick because that's how I knew him in church. So I'll continue that even tonight <laughs> while we are together. So I'm going to let you, Brother Nick, tell us about uh, years in ministry because uh, you've got some years and some experience. So Talk about that for just a moment. All right. Well, I became a Christian when I was 17 years old, and the very next day, almost, I felt God's call into ministry. Mm. Uh, I went off to college the next year and started pastoring a church when I was 18 years old. Wow. I feel so sorry for those (laughs) poor people. (laughs) I didn't know much of anything. Mm -hmm. I knew I loved the Lord, and I knew I loved the people, and uh, I loved the Bible. And so I pastored uh, uh, while I was in college, two different churches while Mm -hmm. I was in college. And then uh, my last year in college, I met Carol Mm -hmm. Richardson, who became Carol Harris. And uh, we got married in December of 1965, and the next, well, a year and a half later, we had our first child, Mm -hmm. and then we had our second one a couple years later, and then another one, uh, Heather, Mm -hmm. about three years later, and uh, that completed our family. Since that time, those three have uh, 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 given us 10 grandchildren, Yeah, and then... uh, Those grandchildren have given us six, or will soon be six, great grandchildren. There you go. That's awesome. uh, That's kind of, uh, and I've pastored in uh, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Texas, but I've spent well over half my ministry in Texas. Wow, nice. Yeah. That's right. right. And still pastoring today. Still pastoring today. Uh Yeah. So. Well, I was able to benefit from years of uh, under his training and leadership and not only helping me know about ministry, but also about marriage and parenting. So uh, you're going to get to hear some of the things that that Heather grew up with and I learned uh, along the way. Uh, In tonight's session, we're going to be talking about the importance of consistency and the things that we do consistently as parents will be what sticks in the long run. The things that we do over and over and over again uh, will be the things that our children will remember and will be the things that shape them. And sometimes it's easy to get discouraged along the way in the process. So tonight will be uh, an encouragement for parents in the midst of the parenting process and who may at times wonder, is this having an effect? Is this going to get better? And what do I do while I'm in the midst of it and still wondering about the future of it? So we begin with a verse tonight from Proverbs 29:18. It says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained or they perish, but happy is he who keeps the law. So it has this uh, this contrast of pictures here. Here's uh, where there is a vision, where there is an end goal, where there is a revelation from God, where there's a purpose, a destination. Uh, there is life. Where there is not, there is confusion, and there is frustration, and there is rebellion, and reaction, and chaos. So in this process of knowing. All right, vertical parenting. I know what I want to see accomplished. I've got a, I've got a picture of what that looks like. Now I have to be intentional about doing the work along the way, taking what may at times feel like some small steps along the way, and and they are, and it's the little steps that add up to some big accomplishments along the way. So, um, brother Nick, you. Uh, you had a mom and a dad right. who raised you. What are some things that they did 
consistently that shaped you into who you are even today? All right, that's a very easy question for me. <clears throat> My dad uh, consistently worked. Hmm. He worked hard. He worked probably 80 hours a week wow. all my life. I actually didn't know my dad very well hmm. because he worked so hard. And the two things that I remember that he taught me consistently was to work hard hmm. and to respect women. Hmm. That, those were the two things he always emphasized to me was to— uh, to be a, a hard worker mm -hmm. and always do more. He said, always do more than is expected of you. Hmm. And then uh, and then the next thing was to always treat women with respect. Hmm. And so now my mother, uh, she was she had a much greater influence on my life. And uh, she was a funny person. Mm -hmm. She loved to sing. She played the guitar and mm -hmm. sang. And I... I can remember <clears throat> almost every day coming home from school, she'd get her guitar out and she'd sit down and hmm. sing to us boys, and we'd uh, we'd hear songs, mostly train songs and <laughs> old country songs, and uh, 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 she would play the guitar and sing, and <clears throat> but uh, and she also loved to cook, hmm. and uh, she loved to play pranks, and so uh, I got a lot of my sense of humor. A lot of my storytelling and mm -hmm. story loving from her, and That's uh, good. we did. We we went to church some. We weren't real active mm -hmm. in church, but uh, and I wouldn't say that the church had a great impact mm. on my life. Mm. But my mother and my dad did. Mm. Interesting. So uh, as you then get married, you and Miss Carol begin to think about having children. I'm sure you must have had in your mind about what you wanted to see accomplished in your children. Talk about that for just a moment, uh, a vision you had for your kids. Okay. All right, well, I will say that uh, the last few years that I was at home, my dad started drinking. Mm. And, uh, and because I really hadn't had much of a father-son relationship with him, I wanted to be a good dad. Mm. And I can remember saying... <clears throat> Uh, I don't care if I never pastor a big church. Mm. I don't care if I never are successful or rich or anything like that. But I just want to be a good dad. Mm. And uh, so that was important to me. And I remember very clearly about a month before our first child was born, going out. Uh, we lived out in the country in Tennessee, and I went out to the trash barrel where we burned <clears> our <throat> trash. Mm. And a lot of times I'd go out there and just meet with the Lord. And I got on my knees that night. Mm. Uh, it was like in October of 1967, and I just I prayed and, and basically said, God, show me what you want my this child to be mm. when she graduates from high school. Mm. So that was kind of my, and so I went back into the house, got my Bible out, started looking, and I, I went to the Beatitudes mm. in Matthew 5, and I went to the Fruit of the Spirit in uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5, and by putting those together, I said, this is this is what I want to see mm. in my children. And then, of course, I didn't know I was going to have two others at that time. But <laughs> as they came, that was what fashioned my mm. vision for the kids. I said, mm. I, I don't care if they're never rich. I don't care if they're pretty or handsome. They all were, but mm. uh, I, that right. wasn't important to me. I don't care if they're ever successful in business. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want them to have this character. I want them mm. to have the qualities of uh, of Jesus. Yeah, that's great. So, with a vision then in mind, you set out and began parenting, and then I'm sure there were some things that you intentionally did, even some things that you consistently did to help get toward that goal. What were some of those things? Well, and I think that's so important because in everything we do, there, consistency is the key, really. Mm -hmm. You know, if a person says, I'm going mm -hmm. to get healthy, uh, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to get healthy, uh, consistency is what really is more yeah. important than even the program that they're on. Or if an athlete says, I want to win a gold medal or I want to mm -hmm. be a successful athlete, uh, uh, they don't just go out and yeah. do their sport they consistently train for it and mm. and uh, I grew up on a farm mm. and uh, <clears throat> we wanted a crop my dad always wanted a crop I always prayed the crops would fail <laughs> because uh, 
<clears throat> that meant I'd be picking cotton yeah, exactly. in the fall. But uh, <laughs> but we we broke the ground up, and mm. then we planted the seed, and then we had to cut out the grass and all that kind of stuff. And so it was just consistently. And so I learned about that mm. uh, growing up. Mm-hmm. And so with with our kids, I said uh, I want to consistently. Uh, I don't know that I said that at that time, but in my heart, that yeah. was what I meant. Right. I wanted to do some things that were going to help move me toward that goal. Right. And so, uh, uh, for one thing, I read a lot. Hmm. I didn't know anything. I didn't. I didn't know anything about parenting. Hmm. I didn't know anything about really being a husband. Hmm. And so, uh, now this was back in 1965, 67. <laughs> not many books. Right. In fact, writing, I think, had just been invented. <laughs> but, uh, but there were very, very few books on, uh, on marriage, mm. almost no books on parenting. Mm. And, but every time one would come out, and in the 70s, they started coming out with a bunch mm. of books. And I tried to buy every one of them that I could. <laughs> and I read uh, literally dozens, maybe even hundreds of wow. books on uh uh, Mary on being a husband, yeah. being a father, because I honestly didn't know. I didn't know how, right. and I had not had any male models hmm. in my life. Hmm. All my uncles, uh, none, none of them. I don't. I don't know of one male model hmm. that I had that I would look at and <clears throat> say, "I want to be that kind of a dad, or I wow. want to be that kind of a husband." <clears throat> so, uh, so cons- I'd say that that's the first thing is yeah. that I. I Read, and then I would say that for me, the most important thing, if you're going to be a consistent parent, mm-hmm. is you have to be a consistent person. Mm. And so, True. I I said, uh, uh, what I want in my children, I must have in my life. Mm. And so, the things I was trying to build in them, mm-hmm. uh, I prayed really, I guess, every day. God mm. help me. Have joy. Mm-hmm. Help me have love. Help mm-hmm. me demonstrate uh, a humble spirit, and help me serve. Right. Uh, and if I want that in my children, I, I have to model it. And mm-hmm. so that was that was, I guess, the for me the main thing. And mm-hmm. then and then there were some things that we did consistently. We we would have family devotions. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we we tried one time. I built a, had, my brother and I built a five sided family altar. It looked like one of these things that elephants put their okay. feet up on at the right. uh, at the circus. circus yeah. And uh, they had five drawers in it. Five <laughs> a little. It, it was it was a beautiful thing. It was. And uh, but it was uh, we used it maybe twice. And the second night that I, of course, the kids, they thought it was something new, something funny, and they would be giggling and <laughs> and up opening the up the, sh- you know, looking in the d- doors and everything like that. And and uh, I got mad. <laughs> and I said, uh, all right, now stop giggling, stop laughing. Yeah, we're we're going to, I'd prepared a theological feast wow. for them, you know. I wow. was going to teach them something great. And, uh, and finally... Uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't tell. <laughs> no, you should. You should. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> finally, I just said, "Okay, all right, no, no, no prayer tonight. I'm not praying with you tonight. Just go to bed." And then my son was on his knees there, and he said, "Oh, Dad, please pray with us. Please pray with us." And I was saying, "No, no, you go to bed. Uh, no prayer for you." you. And, <laughs> and and wow. then all of a sudden, it was like I I was able to see that whole scene from. Maybe God's perspective. <laughs> and here's a preacher daddy t- mm-hmm. saying to his son, who's begging him on his knees, please pray for me, Dad. And I was saying, no. so I said, no, I think we're going to get rid of this uh, wow. family altar. Yeah. And the next night, I took a piece of string, and I laid it on the coffee table, and I said, uh, what can this piece of string teach us about God? And they all looked at me, and I, I didn't have a clue. Mm. So, and then all of a sudden, they began to come up with things. You know, mm. my my son said, "Well, Dad, uh, <clears throat> look, if I pull it, it just follows. 
But if I try to push it, it just bunches up in a wad. Nice. And I thought, hmm, maybe he's trying to tell me something here. <laughs> and then one of them said, well, you know, you could take that string and tie it around your finger, and it'd be a reminder that uh, mm. of something you needed to do. And mm. we, we ended up spending 30 minutes just talking about a piece of string. Wow. The next night it was a bottle cap, and the next night it was a little rock. And mm. so we just uh, – uh, That's good. We stopped trying to be – uh, I guess uh, structured yeah. and official yeah. and theological, yeah. and we just kind of had fun. That's good. Intentional. Intentional. And, very intentional. And consistent. Mm -hmm. And but that means sometimes you learn maybe this approach is not working. That's right. And so consistently you keep pressing forward. That's right. Toward whatever the goal is. And I would say too that we played a lot. I, I love to play with the kids and, mm -hmm. and uh, my wife did too and we, we love to uh, uh, play and uh, we I remember one time it was we were gonna go on a picnic and it started raining and all the kids were so disappointed. And I said, well, I tell you what, let's go on a rainy day picnic. And mm. so we just went out and in the rain, didn't even take umbrellas or anything. We just went out and got soaked. And, of course, our sandwiches were soaked Ooh. and everything. <laughs> uh, but but it was fun. Yeah. And everybody laughed. And we still talk sometimes about our rainy day picnic. That's good. Well, we have the benefit tonight of having Heather here because she, <laughs> she got to live all of that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we'll ask Heather what... What do you remember that was done consistently in the home and that sticks with you even today? Yeah, well, um, of course, I grew up going to church three times a week. And the things that were taught in church by my dad is exactly what was taught at home. And so there was that consistency. Um, we had a very ministry active home where, I mean, we had, it seems like when we had revivals, the 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 speaker would usually stay with us or missionaries would stay with us. Um, so that was a very big part of mm -hmm. our growing up. And um, lots of lots of Bible stories, lots of personal stories when, like when my dad was growing up. Oh, I mean, we have those memorized. I just remember, I mean, just he would repeat them anytime like we would get in the car. We let, Let's hear the story of, you know, Buddy Cisco. Or, and so those were a <clears throat> Those were very consistent. Also, missionary stories, mm -hmm. um, stories of Adoniram Judson and Eric Little and um, mm -hmm. some others. Yeah, Hudson, <laughs> Hudson Taylor. Right? Hudson Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, so those were very consistent. And, and family meals, that was, those were always very important. And um, family devotions, well, we did have those. Yeah. And, um <laughs> Uh, sometimes they were very, very brief, but they do make an impact. They, they do make, I think it's just the, I don't know, it just felt like a safe, safe mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And um, family vacations always made for very fun memories, lots of fun memories mm -hmm. there, lots of laughing, um, lots of singing. Um, both my mom and dad um, love the hymns, and that has certainly carried on with me. And so I... Uh, whistle a lot and uh think of think of him throughout the day many many times during the day and um uh car rides i yeah. i have some great memories of just me and you in the car in fact uh, some of the things that um you you probably don't even realize the things that you said i'll, I'll just name one thing i was probably 13 or 14 and um, we were listening to Stephen Annie Chapman's song, mm -hmm. and um, it was one of the sad ones, <laughs> and uh, it was about children, and um, and I remember crying, and my dad, and daddy just um, putting his hand on me, and he said, I'm probably going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind, this is when I was like 14 years old. He said, you're going to be a good mom one day, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> that... Uh, that really stuck with me. Yeah, yeah, it did. It worked. And it worked. <laughs> That's right. And you may not even remember yeah. that, but yeah, I think I do actually. Do uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, and uh, and and I just give a little shout out to my wife here too. She yeah. uh, she absolutely has prayed. Probably has prayed more. <clears throat> 
for the kids maybe than I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, was, I had so much other stuff to pray for too, you know, <laughs> being a pastor. Yeah. But uh, but my wife was a dedicated mother. Mm-hmm. She she uh, loved her kids. They were mm-hmm. almost her life, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, so. I will say one thing about Mama. Um, when I mentioned laughter, um, that's <laughs> what I think of is just our homes ringing with laughter mm-hmm. with, with her. And, um, of course, one of her consistent things grow- of us growing up was going to garage sales mm-hmm. and um, always finding fun things. And she loved to give things. And yeah. um, that may have passed on down to me, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. Yeah. Those are all true. All mm-hmm. true. So consistency, even in the things that kids may not even see all right. the time. Right. That's right. They don't always mm-hmm. see mom and dad. Praying, right. you know, when the doors closed yeah. and and on their knees and and weeping mm-hmm. for them, right. but that's it's powerful. Yeah, and again, I think that <clears throat> to me, maybe the most important thing is being real yeah. yourself. Yeah. If if you're if you see raising your kids as a project that you do as a boss or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to have one result, but I think mm-hmm. if you see it, you know I want to. I want to be what I want them to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that's that's the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So uh, you mentioned farming earlier, mm-hmm. and of course, the scripture uh, points us to a very similar illustration when it says that uh, whatever a man sows, that will he reap. In other words, what you what you plant is it what you will get as a result. And in that same passage, it it gives us this encouragement in Galatians 6 where it says, And let us not grow weary while doing good. We could even say, Let us not grow weary while parenting. For in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart, if in the process we don't give up. Mm -hmm. So um, with some years of experience now in, Mm -hmm. in parenting yourself and in teaching and helping other parents, what would you say to parents today who are in the middle of it? They are still in the, the planting, cultivating phase. They're not seeing the results yet, mm-hmm. and it it's beginning to get wearisome. Yeah. What do you say to them? Well, I would say don't try to do it by yourself. Mm-hmm. I would say read a lot. That mm-hmm. would again. I just I can't even emphasize enough how important. Uh, this is going to sound real uh, funny, but. <laughs> We don't know what we don't know. Yeah. That's true. And, uh, That's right. and we have to be learners. Mm. If I'm going to be a discipler, mm. I've got to be a learner. Mm-hmm. And so if I, if I want to train my children, I mean, there's so many great books out now yeah. on yeah. parenting. And, and a lot of those tell stories about parents who got weary mm-hmm. and who even had, uh, <clears throat> uh, had kids that didn't. Mm-hmm. Follow their their teaching, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. uh, even with Billy Graham, you know Franklin Graham and and uh, Jim Cimbala and mm-hmm. so many so many uh, John Piper, mm-hmm. they all had sons or or daughters that walked away from their teaching, mm-hmm. but they all came back, mm-hmm. all of them, and, and wow. to read those stories, and and to realize that. Uh, where I am right now is where I am right now. Mm. It's not where it's going to be a year from now or yeah. five years from now. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, again, I think just like with the farming, mm. uh, if uh, if we had given up when the third week after we planted, yeah. Yeah. you know, I said, well, I don't see anything. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, just right. give it time, give <clears throat> it time. But consistency and time. Uh, according to the scripture, mm-hmm. uh, you will reap yeah. if you don't lose heart. Yeah. And and then a, a second thing I would say uh, is uh, have friends that are going through mm. the same thing you are who have the same goals. Yeah. So I, don't just have good friends, mm. uh, right? But have friends who have the same goals for their children that you mm-hmm. have for yours, mm-hmm. and then uh, you're able to pray together and mm-hmm. encourage one another. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you'll need the encouragement. Sometimes they'll need the encouragement. Yeah. And, uh, and and I'd say, you know, at least f- three or four or five yeah. couples, yeah. you wouldn't want 
everybody, but yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the value of a church, a mm-hmm. good church, Absolutely. where there are other other families in mm-hmm. process with you, that's where right. you can uh, you can share your your struggles, that's right, and your successes, mm-hmm. and, and that's that's good. Um, so we live in a, a culture today that's uh, that's full of change, mm-hmm. and um, it adds another layer of pressure mm-hmm. in the parenting process that makes it um, makes it complicated at times. Mm-hmm. And uh, as followers of Christ, we know there are things that are immovable and unchanging. We know that Scripture is true and uh, never changes. We know that the person of Christ does not change. And those are the things we want to pass on to our children. We want to train them and bring them up in the admonition of the Lord, as the Scripture says. But we live in cultures and times that change. And so uh, what what one set of parents did in one generation may be different than what this one has yeah. to do. And so uh, let, let's talk about that for just a moment because we live in a, a culture today that is dominated by technology mm-hmm. in a way that no other generation has. Right. Right. And uh, even in the midst of this virus crisis, screen time is exponentially up for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're working from home, most likely you're working from a screen. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're training or educating your children at home, you're in front of a screen, they're in front of a screen. Uh, if they have an iPad or device or phone, they're in front of a screen for their communication or entertainment, or you're watching movies. And then um, for many, Mm -hmm. a church experience Mm -hmm. uh, for the adults and for the kids is by screen and Zoom calls, all of that's by screen. Mm -hmm. That introduces another layer of Mm -hmm. potential benefit, but potential problems as well. So uh, given that situation, knowing this is a culture in which we live in today, screen time dominates, it's got some traps with it, what should parents do consistently in light of that? Okay, well, I think, first of all, don't make the screen uh, the enemy. Yeah. You know, you don't want to say to the kids, you know, put that phone down, you know, get off of that yeah. iPad, because... Uh, you're probably not going to be off of it either. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so you want to actually try to use the screen as an enhancement, as a help. Yeah. And uh, and and you know, if if the kids want to show you something that they've seen, you know, you you look at it and try to enjoy it. And <laughs> yeah. it, it may not it. may not fit your yeah. sense of humor or something, right. but you say, ah, it's amazing, and then use that. As a means, then for conversation and yeah. communication, yeah. and so don't don't let the screen become uh, the enemy, but also don't let it uh, be the competitor. You know, yeah. don't, don't let it become uh, the what's the right word I'm looking for here. Um, uh, so don't let it be the enemy, but don't let it also um, yeah, keep us from. Having good conversation right. together, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's something funny that happens the minute you tell a, a child, you know, put, put that, that away. Yeah. That's wrong. Don't do mm-hmm. that. It actually creates more desire that's for that. Right. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So that's a danger. It works even with us. Today. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, it, it, when somebody tells me that I can't go to the store, <laughs> I want to go to the store. So I mean, I, exactly. You know, I hadn't outgrown it. Yet. Yeah, sure. We, we're all in that. Yeah. So uh, I would assume that also increases this need for trying to make the most of face-to-face time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and there are a lot of fun things that you can do. And I think, you know, and of course, this is kind of from my perspective, mm-hmm. I loved to, I love to cook. My wife loved to cook, but mm-hmm. I like to cook more than she did. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I love to take the kids in the kitchen and say, hey, let's cook something together. Let's yeah. do this again. My mother did that with me when I was growing up. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if you can if you can make time with them even more fun yeah and more meaningful right. than what they're getting on their screen yeah then uh, it's not that you're trying to pull them away from the screen you're just trying to pull them toward you yeah, exactly that's and, good and if you need to use some screen time to figure that out get on Pinterest YouTube yeah. whatever it is yeah, what, what are some creative things I can do with my kids absolutely. and family do that and then put it down and, and make those moments yeah, happen make absolutely. the memories mm-hmm. that's good 
Um, anything else you want to add with well, that? I, I have a couple of grandsons, uh, yeah. one of one of yours and one of my son's sons, that love listening to sermons. Mm. And I just, I'm amazed, you know, that uh, here mm-hmm. they're uh, <clears throat> 17 and 20 years mm-hmm. old, and, and their their favorite use of their phone yeah. is to to listen to Christian yeah. messages and Christian right. music and yeah. and I, I just applaud that you know yeah. I, I I I think that's important too exactly. a lot of times praising what they're doing right is 10 times more effective exactly. than criticizing what they're doing sure wrong. sure well and and one of our sons that's what his career is that's yeah. Hunter who's mm-hmm. behind the camera right <laughs> yeah. now he's making all this happen mm-hmm. uh, he loved video technology right. and and games and and still does gaming online yeah. so mm-hmm. um, here he is using a skill and a talent uh, for God's glory mm-hmm. and that's a good thing that's right that's a great yeah. thing Um, Well, the other thing about our culture today that we live in is that it is increasingly um, in opposition to the Christian faith. Mm. It's not uh, the Christian faith is not the popular message of the day. Uh, Biblical standards are are railed against. Um, uh, The Bible is no longer held up as um, uh, our our measure and our goal. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, parents now are raising children in this culture that is uh, now and often antagonistic even toward Christianity, toward church. Uh, the culture is changing. What, what should parents do to help their children in this culture today? Okay. Well, I think the main thing is the, these parents have got to be real. Mm-hmm. They have got to be truly devoted to the Lord, Mm -hmm. firmly convinced that the Bible is the Word of God, Mm -hmm. and they have to demonstrate that in in the way they live. Mm -hmm. And uh, nothing uh, that I know of damages a child's um, faith as much as seeing inconsistency or hypocrisy in their parents. Now, that's... The difficulty of that is that we can't be perfect. Right. Yeah. So we are gonna we are gonna fail. Mm-hmm. But when we do, then we repent. Yeah. And it's good for our kids to see us repent. Yeah. And uh, I know a couple of times. I know with <clears throat> my son one time we had built a new church building when I was pastoring in Mississippi. He was about maybe seven, six or seven years old. Mm-hmm. And we had just finished. We were going to have our first service in it that morning. And uh, I said uh, to my wife, I said, I'm going to go up to the church and spend some time in prayer, kind of dedicate the pulpit area and everything to the Lord. I'm very spiritual, you know. <laughs> and Jason said, well, can I go? Can I go? Can I go? And I said, yeah, I think it'd be good for you to go. I wanted him to see his daddy on his knees up yeah, there praying sure. and everything. <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> I tell you, well, when we opened the door to the sanctuary, mm. <laughs> He saw it just as a new place to play, and he starts running, just running, and woo, woo, and I'm screaming at him, hey, son, son, don't run in here, you know, <laughs> it's a holy place. Yeah, you know? exactly. And then he in, he got up on the on the platform on my holy platform, <laughs> you know, right there by the by the pulpit. Wow. And I'm rushing down, got my red Schofield Bible in my hand. <laughs> And when I got to the front, he did a Geronimo jump right off of the mm. uh, platform mm-hmm. and landed right in front of me. Mm. And I just reached out with my Bible and just whacked him <laughs> right upside wow. the head. Yeah. And uh, he kind of shook his head, <laughs> looked up at me, started crying, and he said, uh, Daddy, I can't believe you hit me with your Bible. <laughs> and again, I got that view from <laughs> heaven. And I started crying, mm. and I dropped down on my knees, and I said, "Son, please forgive me." Wow! I said, "Not not just for hitting you with my Bible." I yeah. said, "That's that's bad enough." Yeah. But I said, "What I need you to forgive me for is that for a few minutes here this morning, I saw this building mm. as more important than my mm. son." Mm. Mm. And mm. Uh, and kids love to forgive their parents. Yeah. <laughs> and he forgave yeah. me, and he hugged me. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, 
And I think the Holy Spirit just kind of whacked me up <laughs> <in> the head <laughs> with the word. Yeah. And so I think I think if we if we want our kids to be authentic and really love the Lord, yeah. They have to see it in us and see yeah. that it's it's actually having an effect in yeah, our life. That's good. Not just that we talk about it, not just that we know how to answer questions, not just that we can win debates or anything right. like that, but that it's actually changing the way we relate. Yeah, that's and, good. Uh, and the way we relate to other people, even right. to enemies. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's true. over the years, I've had. I know it's hard to believe, but I've had some people that didn't like me, yeah. and uh, and they would say ugly things about me. And it's important for the kids to mm-hmm. see how am I going to respond to that? Mm-hmm. Am I going to get mean back, or am mm-hmm. I going to say, "Well, let's let's pray for them"? Yeah. And so, That's good. Uh, and I do remember you teaching that, and I remember that very specifically. I'm because I do think about that now. Um, is you you showed us you know. Always try to see something from the other person's perspective through their eyes, mm-hmm. because there's always something else going on yeah. um, in their life that's causing them to react that way. Yeah. And so I think about that often. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So uh, we're not trying to be consistently perfect. No, uh, we're not trying to be consistently uh, religious. No, either. Mm-mm. We're trying to be consistently real, real. in our faith. I, I, real has been, in fact, one of the first prayers that I remember praying as a pastor mm. when I was about 18 years old was, uh, I said, God, help me be real. Mm. I want to be real. Yeah. And uh, uh, I didn't know it was authentic. That was too big yeah. a right. word for me to know <laughs> back then, but I could yeah. handle real. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that that is valuable today um, in a culture that is increasingly antagonistic of the faith, um, the place where children will learn the value of it is in the home. Right. More than they will even in the church. That's right. And, and they'll they'll determine its yeah, validity, whether mm-hmm. it's real or not, by how real it is right. in the home. So until yeah. it until they reach a point in their life where they can really begin to sense the the power and the personal working of the Spirit of God in their own heart and life, mm-hmm. uh, they are going to key off of the people that are most significant to them. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, obviously, pastors and youth pastors and people like that are important yeah, too, sure. but nobody will have the detrimental effect on a kid any more than a parent who is inconsistent. Yeah and teaches one thing and fails at home and then refuses to say I'm I'm wrong yeah. and I'm sorry. Yeah. And to me every parent must be willing to say I was wrong. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Yeah. And that I think says more about authenticity yeah. and reality than, yeah. than anything else. And then the other one that's similar to that is is the those who would pretend to be a certain way at a church or right. around certain, you know, other church people, right. but then in the home they act in a completely different way, yeah, different, absolutely. different language and attitudes and practices than they would. That's just as I know. I know many uh, atheists. I have a special love for atheists. Mm. I really do, and I have a lot of a lot of friends of mine who are atheists, mm-hmm. and every one of them would say I was raised in a home where my usually dad mm. acted one way at church yeah. and totally <clears throat> opposite at home. And uh, uh, you, you're, you want to make an atheist out of your kids, yeah. I'd say preach one thing and practice something else. Mm. Yeah. And they, they don't know how to handle that. No. Yeah. I don't know how to handle that yeah, either, but exactly. I know how better than, they, than kids. Yeah. yeah. And at that if that's what you consistently do at home, that is what will stick. That's yeah. right. Exactly. So it, the, the truth is the truth here. <laughs> what you do consistently is what will stick. That's right. Whether you're consistently yeah. walking in authenticity or whether you're consistently walking in, in hypocrisy, in hypocrisy mm-hmm. of some kind. Whew, that's good. That's good. Uh, one more question then. 
Um, in the culture today, uh, things are changing rapidly. Uh, every every two to three years, technology is changing at a rapid pace, and we're trying to learn new operating systems and new cell phone technology and a new app and a new way of using our TV. Everything's changing. Mm-hmm. The, the words change. The conversations change. Uh, the subject matter in the culture, what's important changes, and that can be difficult for a parent. Yeah. When you're trying to keep up and your children are growing up and all of a sudden they know things about technology that you don't and they're ahead of you and you're trying to keep up. and So it can create some gaps for parents with your yeah. kids. Uh, it can create gaps with children and grandchildren or grandparents. Mm-hmm. What, should some, what should parents do today to help bridge that gap so that while things are changing outwardly, we don't allow that to change who we are as family. Mm-hmm. What what are some things that families can do consistently to help with that? Okay, I'd say one thing is parents need to speak very, very admirably and positively about their parents. Mm, that's good. And uh, if they are if they are talking about their their parents' failures, mm. their parents' inconsistencies, their parents' uh, yeah. negative qualities, and we all have those. Yeah. But if if parents are talking about their parents' negative qualities, then the children are learning to think negatively yeah. about their grandparents. That's true. And, uh, and so that one thing is to always speak positively and admirably mm. uh, and... <clears throat> and, and about about your parents, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and then I think to to spend a lot of time together. Mm-hmm. That's important. I know when your kids were little, mm-hmm. we loved having them over at the house, and we mm-hmm. had the pop tent, and mm-hmm. we had the swing set, and we had all the things that we uh, mm-hmm. uh, we uh, we we loved to to play with them, yeah. of course, and and I think. That's important. So spending time with them, mm-hmm. and uh, and then uh, another thing I think is to help explain uh, what was different in mm-hmm. our generation. Mm-hmm. I know what one thing I enjoy about listening to you preach, Brian, is almost maybe not every sermon, mm-hmm. but pretty close to every. You talk about something in the seventies or the eighties, <laughs> and true. you know s- some toy you yep. had or something yep. that you you yep. did. And I think that's important for our kids to know that their generation is not the generation. That's good. good. It's their generation. Yeah. Yeah. But your generation was just as important as theirs. And then your parents' generation Mm. was also just as important. That's true. And. uh, that's true, and of course, then the great grandparents. You know, <laughs> so we're we're great grandparents now, yeah, yeah. and uh, and I look forward to to having that kind of influence with yeah. with yeah. our great grandchildren. Yeah, well, there's great value in a family when there is the the sense of tribe. Mm-hmm. You know, there's generations right. mixed there. So when your children see a way of life in your home. And they go to the grandparents, and they see a similar way of life with some differences to it. But they see the consistency; mm-hmm. it builds stability right. in their own life. That's right. So that's important. Yeah, that it is and important. And I, I know not every family has this. I'm so thankful for for our family mm-hmm. because we've had third, four, four generations now yeah. of Jesus followers, <clears throat> right? And uh, uh, I really feel for for families that are they're the first generation, yeah. and they don't have the uh, the generation that they can point to and right. say, you know, yeah, Dad taught me this, and mm. and uh, uh, so that's uh, I think if that's the case, you still want to honor your parents, right. mm-hmm. and you still want to speak positively about them, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and you still want to teach them the yeah. generational differences. Yeah. yeah. And and then be the ones who start that process. That's right. Yeah. Build, yeah. build a new That's generation. Right. Absolutely. So, well, uh, you can see why uh, he's been so influential for me and for Heather and our family. And uh, I wish we had a lot more time. We'll have to find a way to make mm-hmm. some more time yeah. to do <laughs> some of these things. So uh, thank you. 
for being with us tonight. Uh, we're going we're gonna to close out our session tonight with a, a reading that Heather's going to read for us. It's called Children Learn What They Live, and it really drives home the importance of what we do consistently in our home and the impact that it has. So, uh, Heather, read this for us. If children live with criticism, they learn to condemn. If children live with hostility, they learn to fight. If children live with ridicule, they learn to be shy. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. And if children live with tolerance, they learn to be patient. If children live with praise, they learn to appreciate. If children live with acceptance, they learn to love. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If children live with honesty, they learn truthfulness. If children live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves and others. If children live with friendliness, they learn the world is a nice place to, in which to live. All right, that's good. And the only thing I'd add to that is if children live in a home where there is consistent realness, mm -hmm. then they will develop a consistent stability in their own life. And that's what we all Amen. want. So I, I'd say to you who are in the midst of it, uh, don't grow weary while you're doing good, while you're parenting. Uh, your work is not in vain. Uh, continue on. Press on. Keep watering. Keep keep fertilizing. Keep removing the weeds. There's a harvest coming, and that day will come. Don't give up in the process. Amen. So uh, I look forward to you joining us next week. It'll be our last session of Vertical Parenting. We're going to talk about how to make home the best place on earth to be. And uh, I'm excited to have some of our kids joining us for that. So uh, thanks for being with us tonight, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>